you know what, we're going to give it a shot and then I'll check the recording afterwards. And if it sucks, then I'll find a different way to do it in the future. We're taking it day by day now. Bye. There we go. Anyway, now we'll start. Sorry for the delay. Hopefully this is recording and we'll have access to it. Um, so just like a little bit in what's going on, I appreciate you all being flexible again with last week. Um, I know a lot of professors, I found out I was more in the minority and that I was in person. I didn't realize that. Uh, and so we went virtual last week because there's obviously like lots of cases and I had students in multiple classes having issues. And so we went virtual for that week. Um, Per university guidelines, essentially what they want, if because like I have to like talk to lots of people and track this down. I'm sure you guys are getting lots of emails, hopefully not as many as I am. The current plan is that everybody thing stays the same unless you have a positive. So like we're in person fully with no virtual option, unless there's a positive case. And if there's a positive case, then we can basically be in person wearing masks, right? Or you can go to this hybrid option. Um, so we have to be mask mandatory this week. And I'm going to plan on if I can get it to work, which I'll find a way eventually. I think it's recording now uh, to be virtual, not virtual, to record all the lectures for students that maybe can't come in case something happens. Like if you get a positive case and you can't come, then you can communicate with me individually. But besides that, we will be in person after this week until things change. You won't have to wear masks, but there's a good chance that you will. But every week I will bring masks just in case. Um, but that's the plan right now. I've heard horror stories of classes having issues of like students having like fights with professors and stuff about not wearing masks and all these things, right? Unfortunately for you guys, I'm like ultimate small pond professor and that I'm still a year out for my doctorate. I've been teaching for three years. I love this job, but I'm not a tenured professor. So please don't fight with me on it because I'll lose. Like if I have to go to the university, be like, oh, so. <laughs> but you guys are fantastic. I've never had any issues with. OSU Tulsa students. I started teaching here this year. I taught at OSU Stillwater before that, and it's fantastic. I like it here. So, so there are a couple of lectures that are my favorite this year. Uh, one is the ethics chapter, boom, and the other is the HR chapter, and that's probably because I teach HR and I also teach ethics. So I have entire courses over this what we're going to talk about today. Uh, unfortunately, this is supposed to originally be like a two hour lecture broken up between, you know, two days, but because of the way the exam schedule ended, uh, I'm going to keep this to one lecture, which means I'll spend less time talking about like specific definitions and their different hard differences. So if I skip through some slides, that's why I still put them in with as much detail as I can. So you have them. And today we'll talk about kind of bigger picture stuff that I find is important. But I do love this lecture. I also have to do seating chart stuff. We'll deal with that at the end. Someone don't let me forget. Uh, yep, last week we talked about management theory, all that kind of jazz. Today we're doing ethics. Upcoming, uh, due this week is chapter three, Ubercase and Smartbook. Also, if you haven't put your company selection in, please make sure you do that. Uh, that does have to be done before you do your like short paper, right? So I need to know what company you're gonna do it on. If you're not sure, just go look at uh, in Canvas, you can go to the assignments tab and I have like short paper one, two, three, and the long paper there. You can click each of them and it'll tell you what all you have to do for the paper. So just make sure you choose a company that you can answer those questions. If you choose a company that has readily available information online, so they're semi popular, then you're probably going to be fine, right? Like I, I would just avoid very small businesses. As long as it's something large ish, you'll be okay. Um, also, lucky for you guys, there's not a ton of people. Like, I've taught classes that have like 80 students, and then I have lots of crossover with companies. This class, if you choose one of the larger companies, you'll probably be okay, unless like six of you choose Apple. Besides that, just make sure you send me your first couple choices, and I can almost guarantee you'll get one of the two. 
It's funny. I always give that speech, and then like I'll always have like nobody choose like Google or Apple because they're afraid somebody else will. And then, please. Is it not published? Does it say, do you have it on your computer right now? Do you mind if I come look really quick? Yeah. I don't want to invade your space here. Okay, all right. I apologize. It said I set the date for it to not be due in part to be open now and not due till then, but I guess because it's part of a module that's not um, are not published, it won't show up. So thank you for telling me that. I'm going to grab my stuff so I can write a note of that to open it up after this class. But anyway, yes, choose your two companies. You have until the 30th. I'm gonna be honest. As long as you ask before you write your paper, I don't care that much because it only kind of harms you if you wait, you know what I mean? Um, and I basically what I do is I go in there and every time somebody submits a company choice, I can just click it and then read it and then say accept. Uh, if you're worried about somebody choosing yours, I would choose earlier rather than later. And then uh, exam one, believe it or not, is next Wednesday. Uh, I submitted a request to uh, reserve a computer lab for the three different time periods. I haven't heard back yet. Um, if I don't hear by Wednesday, I'll start calling a bunch of people, but they're usually kind of behind on that stuff. So I'll send you guys a location. It'll be during class time. You'll just go to a different location, probably in this building or the main hall across the street, and we'll meet in the class or a uh, computer lab and do it then. Um, once I have the final test bank, I usually send out like a little study guide over the weekend. That'll just say, hey, pay attention to these things from the lecture and from like the book and stuff. Cool. Great. So first question, starting off. This is very broad. There's no specific answer or correct answer. But what is the purpose of an organization? What does it mean for an organization to be ethical? What is the purpose of an organization? What does it mean for an organization to be ethical? To get your attendance points today, if you get on Canvas, if you have a computer, if you don't, it's okay. On Canvas, on this week, week three, hopefully this is up. Show me the, there should be an attendance for uh, 124. If you click that, you can answer this question in there. If not, you're welcome to write your answer on a piece of paper and hand it to me at the end, and I'll grade it. It's just easier to grade it if it's online. But I want you to take just a few minutes. Don't make this like a huge paragraph right of thing. Just so I know you're here, answer this question, either on paper or on Canvas, two, three minutes. And then we're gonna discuss it real quick before we jump into this lecture. And someone can confirm you do are able to work with that, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. I don't know what it is about fundamentals. Something like this course, every time it transfers every semester, I have no issues with all my other courses. And I don't know if there's just so many moving parts in this one, but like dates and stuff never seem to work right. It's, I mean, 100% probably user error.
been like one more minute now. company anything so this is this i mean obviously different companies can have different missions and values and all that stuff but what is the purpose of organizations and surely you wrote something down so everybody should have something organization is to accomplish a set of goals, whether that's making money or rendering service or changing the environment or whatever they want to do. Okay, so for-profit organizations, would you say is to make money? Because you're for-profit organization, so let's say let's exclude nonprofits. I don't know who's talking. I'm so sorry. Okay. Who is it? Me. Okay, got it. I thought I was looking right at you. I thought it was you this whole time. Um, is to so for profit organizations is to make money. Is that what you're saying? Right. Okay, so to make money, accomplish a set of goals. All right. Anybody else? Like share their values. Share their values? Yeah, like share their values with uh, okay. the world environment they live in. Share whatever their values are. I guess if they're a non profit organization, especially. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? I'm social, man I'm social management and employees. Uh, Work together to meet common goals. Okay, so to meet common goals, whatever those goals are. All right. Anybody else? At least one more before I ask the next one. Even if it's similar to the other answers. We want to work together to have the same thing. Okay, so if organizations' purpose is, are you saying put people together that are trying to do the same yeah, thing? Yeah, like they have the same, like, um, <clears throat> you know, how people have their core values mm -hmm. and beliefs and, you know. Yeah. Okay. Company, the mission statement. Got it. So to fill their mission statement, basically. Yeah. And now, what does it mean for an organization to be ethical? Now, I think this is a fun word. How's it going? I didn't get for. Um, for you to be ethical is to actually do something right that you should do. The time when no one's there, so you're showing the right thing. Okay. Even when no one's around. Okay, so doing the right <laughs> thing when no one's around. What is what defines the right thing? Oh, we're gonna get really philosophical here. It's gonna be fun. <laughs> what is the right thing? Like how, how how do we know what the right thing is? Does that make sense? Like who defines the right thing? The what? The government. The government. <laughs> <laughs> Like most people have a pamphlet, you know, like yeah. it's not going to resolve like what their the ethics is. Okay, so what the organization defines is ethical? Okay. Anybody else? What does it mean for an organization to operate ethical or ethically? Also, it's for you that just came in, we're using this as the attendance question. So please answer this on a piece of paper at the end. Just try to know with your name so I get your attendance. Okay. Cool, thank you. But the, an organization behaving in an ethical way will try to minimize harm caused to the group that activities have an impact on. Minimize harm caused, say that one more time, minimize harm caused to who? Uh, 
caused to the groups that their activities have an impact on. Okay, minimize harm caused to the groups that their that their uh, activities have an impact on. Correct. Okay. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Do ethics for an organization and for individuals do they vary according to where you are, country by country? Ethics do. So good, like what's good and what's bad is variable based on where you are in the world. Okay. Usually you hear this because of like, uh, I had a professor who taught me ethics named Professor Oleg. Now he's at Texas Tech University and he used to work in Russia. And uh, in Russia, yeah, not exactly like got this comparison here, but in, in Russia, he works for a, a, a company that sells liquid glass, glass. I don't even know what the hell that is, but he made a lot of money doing it. And they sold liquid glass, and he talked about how they had competitors, and it was he, he was very resource intensive to do what they did. And he went down to the train yard and bribed all the men that worked at the train yard to essentially say, I'm going to pay you X amount of money per week, and you're going to tell me what this company and this company received this week, right? It's completely standard business practice there, right? He's like, this is very common. Like, I learned this from someone else. Like, this is what we do. That's not actually considered that unethical. That's not like a stab or rush or anything. It's just different values. Um, because here in the United States, you know, it's very uh, something here that we think is not appropriate. Is like if my phone is buzzing over here, you all would probably think that that's not very appropriate for this setting. Like my phone should be off while I'm working. There are other countries that I worked with when I was doing my MBA and after my MBA where it was rude for you, if you're like, like I have two kids and a wife, for me not to check my phone because if there's an issue or I have a family matter at home, it's completely viable for me to say, hey, I have to keep my phone here because I have a family and this is my wife, I have to leave, I don't know what this is, and step out of the room and take it. Whereas here in American business, we're like, oh, you know, you probably shouldn't do that, switch your phone up. You know, now obviously it's emergencies, we think it's okay. But the ethics can vary. So, the way, we have spent a long time in the United States trying to figure out what is, an organization's purpose, right? And as managers, if you're at the top, you have to obviously know, like, why are we here? You know, you're going to set up a missions and value statement. But what is the purpose that an organization is supposed to fulfill? Um, and then outside of that, how does your organization operate ethically? Like, what is good for me may not be good for you. So should an organization operate selfishly for themselves? Is it really unethical if they're operating within the laws, that they're harming the environment or harming a different group, right? You know, we're all against if you do something that harms the environment, oh, maybe that's bad. But what if I make a decision that's legal but smashes another company and you know tens of thousands of employees are left without a job, right? Is that unethical? Because I made a decision that cost tens of thousands of jobs by beating my competitor. And I was like, well, no. But when does it become unethical? So this has been debated for a long time. But everybody here knows Ford's motors, right? They call them you know cars, yeah, truck, plus stuff. So Ford way back in the early 1900s had a group of uh, a couple of brothers that were really um, highly valuable and lucrative uh, partners named the Dodge brothers who ended up creating Dodge, the truck company, right? And car company, I guess. At one point, Ford was super dominant, all right? Very dominant in the car market, in, like entirely. And uh, Henry Ford, the creator of Ford Motors, started to believe that, you know, we have all this money and everybody has the Model T, which is the, the old school black Ford, you know, for our car that you drove around. And he believed that in the future, everybody's going to be driving cars. Everybody's going to have a car, right? Every family's going to have one, two cars, whatever. And cars are extremely beneficial to society. So he openly said, openly, that Ford's next step in the future is we are going to reduce the cost of our vehicles so that more people can buy them, right? Every family can have one or two or whatever. We're going to openly reduce the cost of our vehicles. However, we're going to reduce them in such a way that it's going to harm the company's bottom line. Because our purpose is I want to put a car, I want to give a car to everybody. That's, that's what I should be doing, right? Ford's job is to provide these vehicles because it's beneficial to society. So we're going to reduce it. Now, he said openly, I want to be clear here. This wasn't a strategic decision for the organization. This was like for the organization's bottom line. He openly stated, we're going to reduce cost and harm the bottom line to benefit society. And the Dodge brothers sued him because they have stake in this company. 
the, the company's you know bottom line goes up, they make more money. The bottom line goes down, they lose money. The Dodge brothers sued Ford and said, no, 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 no. We are investors in this company. You have an obligation to us to run this company to the best of your ability. If he makes a strategic decision that harms the company and he thought it was the best of the company, you can't sue over that because he was doing for sure. We know what he thought was best and something bad happened, whatever. That's part of the risk of business. But he stated, this is going to hurt the company, but it's going to benefit society. And the Dodge brothers sued him. And in 1919, I believe it was the state of Michigan court ruled that uh, if you're a CEO, if you own an organization, their purpose is to make a profit. And so he has a responsibility to his shareholders that he can't make decisions to openly harm the company. Now, that has been debated for a long time, right? It's gone back and forth. Lawyers have brought that up before in the past. And where we are at today is we still don't know what really the benefit, like what the purpose of an organization is. But that case was kind of the first case that said, hey, the purpose of an organization is to make money. I'm not here telling you the purpose of organizations to make money. I'm saying that's where the conversation started. Farrell writes the textbook, uh, a very popular ethics textbook. They're at Auburn University. In their textbook, they write, there needs to be a movement away from self-serving corporation. That's the idea of Ford just trying to make money. And a narrow focus on profit maximization. That's what they believed was ethical. We need to move away from self-serving organizations and move more into organizations that are serving society. Milton Friedman, a very famous philosopher here, said the basic mission of business is to produce goods and services at a profit. And in doing this, a business is making its maximum contribution to society and, in fact, is being socially responsible. Or ethical. So Milton Friedman said, well, an organization exists purely to make a profit. That's why they exist. And if they focus on making a profit, that's what's actually ethical. They'll actually benefit the most people by doing that. And maybe he's right. I mean, maybe it's if I maximize my profit, like let's look at Ford. Ford was trying to make a social response, you know, take a step to provide vehicles to everybody and help America, right? However, that didn't just affect the Dodge brothers. That decision also ultimately could harm employees. Like, who's to say that if he didn't continue operating how he would, which I guess he did continue operating that way, so we can see this, create more manufacturing, more jobs, right? More money in the people that are working for his pocket. And then maybe in the future, they can be cheaper and still maintain profit or maximize profit. So it's very, very difficult to honestly say. And what sucks, if you guys my ethics class, you'll know that at the end of everything, it's always like, the answer is, I don't know, it depends. It's up to you. Who knows, right? What is ethical? What is not? So I'll be interested to read everybody's answers and decisions. But I love the ethics conversation. So the basic definition of ethics, the working one that we'll use for this class, is standards of right and wrong that influence behavior. And again, it may vary among countries and among cultures. And values are relatively permanent and deeply held underlying beliefs and attitudes. Some of you guys actually said values when you were defining ethics, right? And that is kind of, an organization is created there are obviously, there's cultural ethics that we create and cultural standards that exist in the United States, but also exist regionally within the United States. I mean, our values here in Oklahoma are different than your values on the West Coast or East Coast, right? Um, and typically your organization has a set of values when they start out that tend to reflect whoever created the organization and they tend to ripple down. And so you, you want your entire organization to maintain these values. Um, and any of your classes, if you guys ever talked about uh, PE fit or PO fit. No, so, so fit is essentially an employee's ability to truly fit within your organization as in what they expect and also their values and how they match with the organizations. And something that we see is a lot of times you'll see companies exponentially grow and then start to crash when they start getting like much bigger and start hiring lots of employees. 
And there's a whole field of research that says this happens because of fit. And you'll hire employees that have different values than your company. And if an employee has to act in a way that is different than the, their values, so if I have to act in this role in this organization, like if I had to stand up here and teach you all something that I didn't believe in, right? I'm having to act out of my values. You get what's called cognitive dissonance, and that's like the number one way to make employees depressed and leave. But this isn't a psychology class. The cognitive dissonance matters. Trying to see? Okay, cool. I got to keep moving. So, there's a lot of different ways to view ethics in my course. Every week, we kind of talk about uh, different approaches to ethics and different ways to kind of like study it and value it and, you know, categorize individuals. Um, but this is what we're going to focus on. Uh, one of the ways we're going to focus on it today. So these are Kohlberg's three levels of personal moral development. Essentially, the idea is that you start at level one and you move up to level three. Level one, which is what you want your employees and your managers to typically not be in, is the idea that you're purely following rules to avoid punishment, right? You don't believe in what you're doing. You don't actually have the same values or the same ethics or whatever. It's just, I'm doing this so I don't lose my job. I'm doing this so I don't get written up, right? Or managers, I'm doing this so that the people above me don't rip me. Conventional is the almost more of like a conforming idea. This is where most managers will fall into. This is you're doing something because it's what ex it's what's expected by those around you, and you want to please and be happy with those. Right? You want those around you to be happy with what you're doing, right? You're trying to please those around you. You're trying to conform. Now, level three, they actually say that only about twenty percent of managers will ever fall into this. This is more of like an elevated version of level two beyond just those around you. This is where your true internal values are what are guiding. So I, I'm lucky that like in what I get to do, I get to fall into this a lot is in the way I believe like management research should be taught, right? I believe what universities should value. A lot of times I get to fulfill when I teach and stuff. And so this isn't me just trying to please those around me because I like them and I like the organization. These truly fall in line with my values personally. Which is why I chose a very autonomous job. Does this make sense? Level one to three. Now we'll talk a little bit about organizational values here. So organizations ultimately have two value systems. Now, most of you guys are going to understand this right off the bat. One is stressing financial performance because we have to survive economically. And two is stressing cohesion and, uh, wow, excuse me, cohesion and solidarity among your employees. So like everybody's happy and everything to be together, right? Now these often conflict. Does anybody know why they conflict or have under, can give me an example of how they could conflict? Be specific. How could stressing financial performance conflict with employee relationships? Oh, like a better a certain job. Yeah, like sales jobs mm -hmm. for sure. Car man, car dealerships. That's like everybody's favorite thing to study when it comes to that. Car dealerships are crazy, man. It's like a totally different type of organization. Anything else? What about like mass layoffs and downsizing? Often you have to do that to protect firm performance, right? But is it always what's best for the employees? Or CEOs not taking a pay cut while taking massive pay cuts to the employees. I'm not taking a side on that. I'm just saying that's a common way to like point. CEOs don't take a pay cut, we have these mass pay cuts and layoffs down the chain. The joke in the business world is that every organization stresses two until one's threatened and then they go to one now that's not always true for organizations but that's like the joke it's like yeah we always care uh starbucks is a fantastic example of this 
because it was the most ridiculous timing. By the way, we fully support Starbucks in my household because we financially prop them up every month because Jael gets a large white mocha pretty much every morning. And seven dollars for a drink is really a crime. But like we pay for it. And so and I make tea from home, but I used to be a crazy coffee drinker. But Starbucks had this whole like I don't want to say campaign, but they were really pushing that they were very employee first, right? We're employee first. Our employees have all these opportunities. Uh, I believe this is 2017 when this all happened. Uh, employees first. Our employees have all these opportunities. Uh, we're going to train them. You know, you're going to have these flexible hours, and it's, it's not too stressful of a job, and all these things. They pushed this for a long time. And then for the first time in, like, X amount of years, they had a quarter in which they uh, they declined by 5% in profit, like projected for that quarter because they grow at a steady rate and had 5% below that. And they had like these drastic changes the next quarter and the drastic changes were to reduce employees hours. That was like the big thing they did. Look, it was very big. Like, we're going to reduce employees hours from 30 to 20 hours, from 40 to 30 hours. Like there was these massive cutbacks. And what happened was it, it affected, you know, Starbucks is a million stores. Um, it affected all these locations in that you had employees that now instead of working a shift with four people, working a shift with two people, they're making twice as many drinks, they have angry customers, and they're constantly going. And there became a big push on Twitter and social media about how Starbucks isn't treating their employees right. There was a big petition created by Starbucks baristas, there were like a thousand people signed it across the country um, that were baristas themselves for Starbucks. And it was just this big, Starbucks had to make this big PR saving campaign um, to like improve employees' lives. And it was kind of funny because what they ended up doing was like increasing the amount of money employees made and stuff like that, but they never actually increased their hours and like fixed the core problem. Um, and that they went over poorly because it was like they all complained about A. So they fixed B and pretended like they were addressing it, but left A like wide open. And that was kind of the case here is Starbucks had pushed that two was the values of their company. And then as soon as they had a problem, they protected one. And that's not a knock on Starbucks. I love Starbucks, don't get me wrong. Whew. That shit is strong. You can't make it from home either. You just can't do it. We've really tried. I go on to talk about I want to talk about ethical dilemmas now. I do. So ethical dilemmas. I don't want to spend a ton of time on this because you'll probably have a question on it. Well, you could have a question on it depending on what he draws for you. Um, an ethical dilemma is essentially when you have to decide between two choices and they both are quote right. Now, my ethics class, we talk a lot about being a manager, and part of being a manager is understanding. What choice to make and the or that having a strong decision process and making your choice and then being able to defend it. Right? Because the whole point of an ethical dilemma is there's two right choices. So it's not like, okay, you're a manager, choose the correct answer between A and B. It is you need to make the decision and then be able to defend this decision. Right? I'm trying to give a good example of this. I don't know. I'm sure one will come to me. But there's been several studies recently that say that uh, the best managers are ones that can identify ethical dilemmas and then uh, choose an answer and essentially defend it. Because it's not always what choice you made. It's how that you can sell it to those around you about how it's being the best choice. Um, like, for instance, in this class, like, not sure if I should go virtual or stay in person. And I have to choose one at some point if we have an outbreak and then, you know, be like, okay, and this is why I chose this. Now, the best way to do this, and I can't believe the book doesn't talk about it enough, so we're going to talk about it, is called the stakeholder approach. This is a big bubble of stakeholders. I've seen this made multiple different ways, but this is one of the ways. I think this is one of the way the book does it. Uh, the stakeholder approach to making ethical decisions, and as a manager, is you all know what stakeholders are, hopefully at some point you're in. So stakeholders, anybody that has a share in your company, right? 
um, in some way. Your company influences them in some way. So a, a true shareholder, not stakeholder, a shareholder is someone that literally owns a portion of your company. So your company's public, someone buys stock for your company, they physically own a part of your company. A stake, a shareholder is a stakeholder, but a stakeholder is also all your employees, it's who you buy your supplies from, it's who you sell your supplies to, it's the local government, it's everybody that your organization affects. I talked about open systems last class, right? In your video lecture. Because of open systems, stakeholders are everywhere. Now the stakeholder approach for an organization is you have to decide who is the most important stakeholder. And then who's the second most important stakeholder? And then who's the third most important stakeholder? And your decisions should be beneficial to the first stakeholder all the way down. Because every decision you make as an organization, especially if you come to ethical dilemmas, is probably gonna harm somebody and then help somebody, right? It's like the idea of zero sum game. Every decision you make can hurt somebody and help somebody, right? If, if I decide that uh, because economic times are tough, I have to pay my, I'm going to pay my employees more or I'm going to pay them the same. I'm not going to cut back. Maybe that means I have to raise my prices. So that means I'm technically harming the customer, right? But hopefully benefiting the employees. And of course, there's butterfly effects. Everything affects everything. But the best way to approach, at least the way we believe now, the best way to approach making ethical decisions or any decision as an organization is to take the stakeholder approach. And that is determine who the most important stakeholders are and make sure you benefit them. Now, obviously, Starbucks at one point declared that the shareholders and top executives were the most important part, and so their decision protected them and harmed, uh, directly harmed lower-level employees. And in a way, they valued customers because their drinks didn't go up. They kept them the same. They took the money out elsewhere, which I don't know how much more Starbucks can get expensive. Daryl likes to pretend like we don't spend a lot of money on Starbucks by loading one of those stupid cards on our phone, right? So at the beginning of the month, you just get like a $50 charge. And then you don't get lots of charges throughout the month where you realize that you're spending $8 here and there, here and there, here and there, right? It's really deceptive. We communicate a lot. Like I know it's just what we're all spending on coffee and stuff, but it's just funny to see like a large charge at the start of the month. And it's like, oh, we bought coffee once kind of, but it was $150. Um, so the community of stakeholders, uh, for time, I don't want to spend too much on this, um, but essentially your, your internal stakeholders here in the middle are going to be people that are directly within your organization, so your employees, right? And then as we move outside, you have the task environment, which are slightly more separated from the organization, and then farther out to the general environment, which is very separated from the organization, but still influential. I still hate how much this is cut off. I don't, does anybody here have any idea how to like do I have to physically move it? There's arrows on here. That does nothing. Why would that work? Hmm. I don't know. I do go into more details here. Um, I don't know how much time I want to spend on all this. I kind of want to get back to ethical dilemmas a little bit more. Let me see. Yeah, we're not going to spend a ton of time because, again, I don't want to go super long on this. Uh, I put a better definition of each internal stakeholders, external stakeholders as we go throughout here. Um, so you all have those, but we're not going to spend a ton of time. Go on here. We spent just a little bit of time talking about ethical dilemmas. And how they're pretty much constant. So now let's get more specific outside of, I already kind of gave you guys the stakeholder approach, but these are the ones the book emphasizes. So the utilitarian approach, this is the idea of doing what is best for the greatest number of people. Right? That is the approach to ethical decision making. Literally the greatest number of people. 
nothing else, no matter where they are, in the company, out of the company, whatever. That's the idea that if I'm here in the United States, should I be destroying all these rainforests overseas that maybe are causing harm to all of these people? But my employees here are making lots of money and the customers here are satisfied. And the argument for this approach would be no, that's not good. Now that gets really interesting when you start talking about having like a profit approach and what Milton Friedman said. It's like, well, your job is to make the most money, like most money possible within legal realms. So that would say you should do that. Um, and nobody said it here, but every so often in my after class, people always are like, okay, well then what's the right choice? And again, there's just, it's gray area. There's no right choice. And there's an argument to be made both ways. My father told me when I was a kid, and it stuck with me for my entire life, that if I can't argue both sides to an argument within five minutes, then I'm not entitled to my own opinion. Which is really harsh to tell a nine-year-old, but I remember it forever, so. Then we have the individual approach. Now, this is what results best in the individual or what is best for the individual's long term interests. The example I put in here. So it's like if you have an agricultural business and they're putting chemical um, fertilizers in their crops every year, right, to like help them grow, to be protected from pesticides, all that kind of stuff. Um, then they're going to benefit, like the individual is going to benefit and those directly close to them are going to benefit. However, the fishing industries downstream that are getting these chemical runoffs, uh, it may reduce the number of fish and cause problems there. I almost put a clip in here. Let me see if I did put the clip in here. Okay, good. I did it. Oh, I didn't put the mural. Oh, I apologize. I switched the individual approach on here and not up here. I'll let you guys have a second to look. Then we have the morals rights approach. This is literally the idea that all humans have basic moral rights and that your decision can never violate those. Right? Now, this sounds obvious, very obvious, right? But uh, do you all believe, yeah, you guys know exactly where I'm going with this. Do you all believe that as an employee, you have a right to privacy? Like as a person, you have a right to privacy, right? Yeah? No one can say no. I don't care. Yes? No? Depending on what? If you're at work. If you're at work, but at home, you have privacy. Right? Okay. Does anyone want to argue for you have privacy, you don't have privacy at work? Anybody believe that you should have full privacy at work? No? Okay, I'm going to assume no. So you don't have full privacy at work. Um, does anybody believe that there should ever be a crossover between your job and home life privacy? So that means your employer, you, you don't have perfect privacy at home because of your job. Yeah, please. Yeah. Living at an apartment complex uh -huh. where I worked, that was definitely like a integration of the two. Didn't have a whole lot of privacy because everyone knew where I lived. So. Oh, oh my gosh! People like come like knock on your door and ask questions. Oh, that's terrible. You probably got a great deal living there, though. I hope. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so um. If you use a biz and organization email, right? Like I use set.smart.okstate.edu and I use it for like literally everything because I don't want to check two email addresses and OSU can read every single email I send, right? Like all the time, like they can read all those conversations. Um, now that's kind of known upfront that that's going to be the case. But here's a more difficult one. I, Used to be the manager of a facility that had uh, that coached gymnastics, right? Like we offered gymnastics and uh, ninja warrior kind of stuff and classes like that. And so I had lots of coaches for me that were between the age of like 18 and 21, 22. And they coached a lot of people that were usually ranging from the age of four years old all the way up to like 16, 
right? That was very common. Okay. Now, most of these were college students that lived their own lives and whatever, and why they were within the walls of my organization. No cussing. You got to dress appropriately, right? Um, we didn't really have like a big thing on tattoos or piercings or anything, but you couldn't have like a tattoo showing that was vulgar or anything. So if it said something or whatever, it's got to be covered up somehow, stuff like that. And you all can agree, I, I hope, maybe some of you don't, is that a fair standard? Right? Like you're here, you're teaching children. If you work for us, you, you can't act a certain way. Parts of your life you can't expose here. Okay? Right. Most of these people, the parents get to know the coach pretty well. And most of these people have Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, whatever social media. I one time had a parent come to me super freaked out and disgusted because they had a, I had a coach that coached cheerleading and he and another female coach had agreed to be a part of um it was like a, they were both like attractive very fit people and they were part of this like instagram modeling thing and they took pictures where they were both essentially naked you couldn't see anything but the idea was like they were having sex in the picture and they took this picture and it was advertising something i don't even know it was like a fragrance it even makes sense to me um but they were they were advertising something and the mom shows me the picture of both of them because one of them had posted it on their Facebook, right? Now I'm like, holy hell, what do I do, right? So does that employee have right to privacy over what happens outside or does it bleed over in the fact that I'm like, well, you work with kids and you know, 14, 13, 14 year olds can use Facebook. Like they can definitely Facebook you and look you up. And if his profile was public, anybody that knew his name could find him. And my 12 and 13 year old cheerleaders could look him up and see those pictures. So this approach seems so simple. The moral rights approach, you have a right to privacy, you have a right to all of this, but it's not always that simple. At what point do I have to be like, ah, you can't. Now, luckily, I don't know what really the right answer is. I had a good relationship with this employee and I just said, you gotta make your profile private just to help me out. And they made the profile private and he wouldn't friend um, like students or anything like that. So they couldn't see it, but it, it was his life outside of it. Right. I mean, at one point I had an employee that taught, um, taught a lot of like younger gymnastics and stuff like that. And then she also got a job as an exotic dancer and they, the two were married. She had to keep everything separate. They would only bled over for like five days and then she left. Um, but it's like, what does it matter if it's not affecting her work at all? Right. And so because everybody has the right to their own privacy. I don't know. I don't know what the right answer is. What I did is I created two Facebooks. I had one called Coach Smart and then my normal Facebook and everybody could friend me on Coach Smart that only had great pictures and happy whatever. But if you find me on social media, I'm super boring. There's nothing there. So then finally, we have the justice approach. Now, the justice approach is all about fairness and equal, um, equity and equality. Now, this gets like and there is like the standards of fairness and equality which is between like race and age and gender but also it gets more complicated and like should the ceo make 300 times whatever the lowest employee makes maybe Now, this always comes up with fairness in particular, um, because it's like, how much do you pay someone based on how difficult their job is? Because if you guys don't realize, or I'm sure you have kind of noticed, in society and as managers, you don't necessarily pay employees based on how difficult their job is. I mean, ultimately what you pay employees is you pay them based on how many people can do their job and how available they are, right? Like if you have a lot of people willing to do a job, no matter how hard it is, Maybe they're paid less, but if you don't have a lot of people willing to do a job and let's say maybe it's not super hard, but you don't have a lot of people that can do a job and maybe you pay them more, right? That's why people don't always like professors because there are professors. I'm not saying here, there are professors at universities that make a lot of money, like teaching mostly, like they published a few good papers and they make pretty good money teaching. But the only way you're allowed to teach at those universities is to have a PhD, right? So you have to be a doctor. And you know what's super interesting about PhDs over other degrees? 
you get your degree here in undergrad or master's or whatever, you have like a set of classes you have to pass. And once you get those classes passed, no one can stop you, right? Like you get that degree. You get those hours, you get your degree. PhD is interesting because you can only become a doctor once a room of doctors decide you are, and it's 100% arbitrary. So like you come in front of them and you're like, well, let me be a doctor. And they decide yes or no. And there's like a talk about that, about how PhD has like an artificial barrier and they can regulate how many professors there are and are not. So like if a lot of people want to become a professor, like all the sudden it's like, okay, I'm going to get my PhD. It, it doesn't matter because they can be like, okay, well now we have a hundred people trying to become doctors this year. We're going to accept 20. Now we have a thousand people. We're going to accept 20. Like they can artificially cut it. So. That was just a mini rant. It's kind of cool. <laughs> Here we're like super fair. Honestly, in this department at LSU, if you can make it all the way to your dissertation defense, then you're going to get through it. I've never seen anybody fail their dissertation defense. That idea that people fail their dissertation defense is so blown out of water. Like, I've never actually seen anybody fail it. Any questions so far? I don't want to go too much longer, but I know we have quite a few slides left. I I've hit the big things that I like. And that I think are important to actually talk about, and that may be more confusing. A lot of the other stuff's pretty definitional. Cool. Great. I'm doing my best to stay near here. You probably can't hear anything on this recording. Whatever. It's a pretty sensitive mic. Oh yes. It's gonna flip so soon. So I do all of my research. All of my research, almost, in counterproductive work behaviors, people harming organizations, right? So now we're going to get very nitty gritty within organizations and talk about ethical decisions, right? And what's right and what's wrong. Um, what do you think the number one thing is that employees do that are against company policy? So very consistent. Almost every organization you work for has this policy in place, and it's the most violated one, period. Feel what? Time. Time theft. It's crazy. It takes up like all CWB, right? Time theft. Unless you count gossiping, some people don't. Some people do count gossiping in research. We count gossiping. It happens a lot. So 41% of employees say that they've witnessed something that they would consider unethical conduct in their organization. 41%. It's about half, a little less than half employees. Now that's interesting because most people also don't consider time theft uh, when they're within an organization as actually unethical. So uh, because human brains are very interesting. If you as a person do something wrong and it's unethical, because people ultimately want to act ethically. If you didn't know, the human brain naturally tries to do the right thing. Okay? If you do something that you all just told me was wrong, what's the first thing the human brain does? Because we never want to be in the wrong as people. Try to cover it up. You justify it. You don't want people to know, one, that's why it's hard to measure because people hide their bad behaviors. And two, you justify the behavior, right? So when I do studies and I ask all these people, I did interviews with 50 people. And these 50 people that I interviewed, I think I had 10 openly admit at the start that they've done something unethical at their organization, right? At the very beginning, 10 said they had. Um, so I say, have you ever done anything unethical? Have you ever harmed your organization in some way? Have you harmed employees around you in some way? No. Okay? For 40 people. At the end of the interview, all 50 had given me one to 10 things they had done wrong. Right? Because what I do is I go, okay, have you ever um, clocked out early and not put it on your page? Like, not actually written it out? Clocked out late? Taken an extra long lunch break without telling anybody? Come in late in the morning? Anything like that? Use company time for something besides work? So you're on the computer on Facebook? This, 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 and this. And everybody goes, yes. And then the follow-up is, but it wasn't like, that's not bad. Or I actually worked extra on this day, so I have this time here, right, to do that. So that's the most common. So misuse company time, abusive behavior. That could be gossip, saying something rude to somebody, um, playing a mean prank, anything like that. Uh, employee theft, what I mean by that is physical theft. That does not mean stealing money necessarily. That could be like using the company printer for something that's not part of the organization's like goals. So for personal reasons, uh, workplace cheating. So like falsifying reports or kind of like what we saw at uh, Wells Fargo. 
and violating corporate internet policies, which is like obviously super common. Now, what's even more interesting about that 41% of employees that said that they saw something unethical happen to the organization is almost all of that 41% reported was about a manager. So, pretty cool, right? So research suggests that managers might be the most unethical people. I love CWBs. Okay, we'll watch a little bit more here. So because this is so bad, and if you didn't know, CWBs and time theft and uh, cost organizations billions of dollars a year, billions with a B. Um, if you look at a company like Walmart, they actually incorporate, last time I checked, it's been so many years, it's probably wrong. They had a $350 million theft budget at one point, and that was the idea that as long as we stay below $350 million in theft, we're not going to pursue it. Like, there's, it, we, it's not worth our time to investigate or make changes. And the majority of theft in an organization is your employees, right? It's employees still the most from organizations outside of, like, customers and stuff. I always wonder if that's true for Walmart, though, because that place would be so... Every time I leave that place, I'm like, I walked in, grabbed stuff, scanned it, put it in a bag that we all have a thousand of underneath the, like, sink at our house. And I walked out the door, and I never interacted with anybody. Like, this has been so easy just to leave. But how can organizations promote ethics, especially as a manager? Uh, the first one is to create a strong ethical climate. To create a strong ethical climate, that sounds super easy. It generally includes things like setting values at the front, hiring employees that match those values, demonstrating those values, and rewarding those values. Right? If you're rewarding them, oh, and punishing what you don't want. But if your people that are in charge or are ahead are not demonstrating these behaviors, then you can never in a million years expect the employees to. One of my favorite things that happened at a place I, uh, a place I worked was every, we had an owner that used to be a health inspector and every night insisted everybody clean the entire place, like hard, like real clean. And one of the things that made no sense to any of us was, I mean, it makes sense. We had a big lobby with lots of chairs and he was like, I want you to pick up all the chairs, sweep the entire room, mop the entire room, and then the employees that get their first thing in the morning will put the chairs back out, right? And that's what we're going to do. Now, that takes forever. I mean, the lobby was huge. Right? There's only like four employees on staff. One of that every single day. And he came in later in the morning. So, like, employees were there first, so he didn't see. And uh, employees would come there and get trained for, like, a couple of weeks or whatever, right? And then my very first day, I get trained for, like, two, three weeks, whatever. And then I'm there, and then it becomes night. And at night, uh, I'm going through the cleaning checklist and the, not really manager, they're like the team leader, like the person that's like in charge, like bottom level manager. When we get to the clean in the lobby, they go, no, 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 no one does that. On Friday, before boss band comes in on Saturday, we do that. Monday through Friday, you never do that. Like, do not do that. So that place actually didn't get cleaned Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then Friday night, cleaned once. And then Friday Saturday came in. But because the one person that was in charge that was there and demonstrating the behavior was like, no, nah, don't do that. We were like, all right, hell yeah, don't do that. So we didn't. And I knew it was wrong, but I was like 16, 17. Couldn't pay me enough. I didn't care. And then the... Two, three, and four are all, as I already kind of talked about them, are all basically bleeding up into one and creating a strong ethical climate. So again, that comes down to hiring the correct employees, that screening employees, have standards set ahead of time, ethics coach, training programs, train employees. Um, I should put, I wish the book put it in here, make sure you demonstrate those behaviors. Um, and then rewarding ethic behavior, ethical behaviors. And very importantly, protecting whistleblowers because, uh, you all know whistleblowers are correct. Someone that's like, ah, oh, the organization's doing something bad, and they get loud about it. Uh, we try to put programs in place to protect the whistleblowers, especially after Enron. However, if you go and you interview people about, like, why didn't you speak up despite this program? Because everybody will say, someone's going to find out. It doesn't matter. I can't be the one that got loud, right? What about this? I 
think we're going to leave most of this other stuff here. I will say one last thing I'm going to say. Make sure you understand the difference between social responsibility and corporate social responsibility. Social responsibility is typically considered more individual, and it's the idea that a manager is acting in a way that's best uh, for society in general. Corporate responsibility is the notion that corporations are expected to go above and beyond the law and making profit to help so the society and make you know, responsible choices. Cool? Cool. What is it like, 4-6? Perfect. Um, We'll be in class on Wednesday. If you all have any questions for me, please let me know ahead of time. I appreciate all your all's help with all of this. Uh, make sure you've either submitted your answer uh, online for the question at the beginning so you get your attendance, or you bring me a physical copy. I'm pretty sure that question locks at 5 o'clock, so if you haven't done it yet, you can. But And I will post something that has like my YouTube page that people can go to. It only has videos for this class or other classes, and I remove them all afterwards. Um, and if this recording didn't work, I'll probably try to re-record it tonight and then figure out a way to make it work Wednesday. Awesome. Thank you all so much. I'll see you Wednesday. I appreciate it. Thank you.